stool, and somebody said, that's bad for your back to sit on the stool like that. So today, there's no stool. <laughs> maybe you can find, maybe we can find just a chair. How would that be? I want to be informal when you guys and somehow standing at the lectern. You understand this is not the podium. Do we all know that? How many people thought this was the podium? Okay, P-O-D. What does that mean sometimes? Podiatrist, what else? Well, the point is the thing you stand on is the podium, like when I conduct. And the thing you talk from is the lecture. And I'm not going to give you a lecture, I'm going to give you a talk with question and answers. So I'm going to sit down and make myself a Can you all see me? Absolutely. Okay. So I want to make sure I'm not bending my tails because then for the concert, everybody will say I've got to go to the cleaner and get his tails done right. Oh yes, my socks. These are musical socks. They have musical signatures and things on them. Thank you. Okay. Today we're doing music that was, it got its inspiration from Shakespeare. Okay, I think there's a, a new TV show called Will. Shakespeare before he was Shakespeare. He was just Will. Okay. That's on one of the TV stations coming out pretty soon. Saw that on a bus bench, by the way. So, and I've wanted to do this concert for many years, and it's hard to find the right balance of classical music referring to Shakespeare and popular music referring to Shakespeare. Because of course we've got Kiss Me Kate. That was that was a Shakespearean plot and a Broadway show. Uh, and so on. Well then the, they came out in the last decade and things like like uh, oh gosh. Shakespeare in love. Shakespeare in love. Great time. Okay, and a number of other things, and it just fell together, and all of a sudden we had a Shakespeare show in my mind. And so what we're doing today is we're doing some very, very classical music inspired by Shakespeare. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, The Merry Wives of Windsor. Okay, and that's really about Falstaff. Okay, and it, it was written in the first half of the 19th century by uh, a composer called Otto Nikolai. And Otto Nikolai was a Viennese composer. And I first played this piece as an 11th grade um, French horn player in the All State of California High School Honor Orchestra. And we played this piece, and I just thought it was so lovely. And I've conducted it maybe once before. I don't know, it's just one of those pieces I keep forgetting about. Once I remember it and start looking at it again, it, it remains, it's very beautiful. Very beautiful and very much of the style of Beethoven and Mozart and so on and so forth. There's another piece I want to talk to you about that's, that's going to, I believe, begin the program and ending the first half of the program is another very serious classical piece. And let me tell you the story about this. This is really interesting. There was a wealthy Jewish boy, although he wasn't brought up to be a wealthy Jewish boy. He was Jewish enough that Hitler burned all his music during World War II. His family had converted to uh, Protestantism, and so his name was Mendelssohn, which is a very Jewish name. So it was Felix Mendelssohn hyphen Bartholdi. And Bartholdi was his last name. And he 
lived in, in Germany in the beginning of the 19th century as a Protestant boy. He wrote uh, his fifth symphony, is the Reformation Symphony. So he, he was uh, very much into um, being a Christian person at that time in his life. Um, Oh, he went on to uh, do a whole bunch of religious music. Uh, uh, great oratorios, actually. The other thing he did is he is the one that discovered, or I should say rediscovered, and made important Bach. We might not know about the B minor mass and St. Matthews and all that stuff if this uh, ethnically Jewish German person had then covered this music. And uh, he just did a great service to music in general. He died when he was about 35. Yeah. So, what the heck happened? Well, he came from this wealthy banking family. And this family <coughs> supported his whims as a musician. So it was, Daddy, I need a string quartet. I want to hear what my piece sounds like. Sure, hire a string quartet. Do you remember Richard Strauss a few weeks ago? We had the same deal where he had a wealthy daddy and he had whatever. He not only had a wealthy daddy and mommy, he had a dad that was a part of the Royal Opera in, in Bavaria. But Mendelssohn was able to acquire all the musicians he needed to learn and hear. And that's so valuable if you can imagine composing something in your mind, putting it on paper. And the best you can do is maybe thump it out on a piano. But what does it sound like when you begin with two flutes, the next chord is two flutes and two clarinets, the next chord is two flutes, two clarinets, one bassoon and one French horn, and the next chord is all of the above, plus the oboe. I mean, every single chord changes color magically and very subtly by adding these single instruments to this, and that's the beginning of this fabulous overture that we're going to hear, and it's called the Overture to Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay? Uh, how many have heard that? Yeah, it's a popular piece. Um, it, it's very virtuosic. Funny story, I, had, I rehearse sometimes slowly, just to get the notes clear for my musicians. It's slower than full speed, let's say, not slow, but closer. So, so then at the end of this portion of the rehearsal, I went back and I went faster. And the concertmaster came up to me after the rehearsal and said, oh, that faster tempo, you've got to do it. Oh, that's so easy to play. Oh, that's, that's the perfect tempo for it. Not a minute later walks up my principal second violin. And this guy is a world-renowned guy in his time. He walks up and says, that last tempo is way too fast. You have to do, you have to do the first tempo. And then the, the Ukrainian first violin comes up to the Armenian second violin and says, that's not right. The fast tempo is the correct tempo. And they're going on and just battling, I'm just standing back. <laughs> you know. So anyway, we'll see how it goes today. I hope you think it's the right tempo. Whatever, whatever I pick, I hope it's the right tempo. All right, as you listen to this piece, you're gonna have, you're gonna hear something that goes like this. What is that? What is that? Sounds like a donkey. Remember, that's, from, that's American music. But back in 1827, this little man, oh, I keep calling him little man, he was 17 years old. Mendelssohn was 17 years old when he wrote the Overture to Midsummer Night's Dream. It is still today 
heard on KUSC and, and etc. It's still beloved today. He was a 17-year-old teenager and he wrote this piece. Okay. What I actually learned studying, because I get great pleasure out of conducting CalPhil. It's a wonderful to be with these fabulous artists in my orchestra. I mean, they're just, many of them at a world-class level. They're just very fine trumpeters and horn players and oboists and violinists. They really are. I'm just, the best orchestra I've ever conducted in my lots of years of conducting. Um, But these talks where I have to kind of learn something and I kind of refresh my memory. I mean, being a doctor, I learned a lot of stuff, but there's always something new that's come out or something you may have never heard or, or forgotten. And I didn't realize that the overture to Midsummer Night's Dream wasn't the overture to the play. Now there's incidental music, which includes the wedding march, the nocturne, um, and uh, these other pieces. There's about 21 minutes of what they call incidental music, which was composed to cover up the stage changes of the actual play. It's Every Night's Dream by Shakespeare, and then there was this music that was a part of the play. And I figured they just started the Shakespeare drama off with the overture to Midsummer Night's Dream, and then they played the incidental music as it came along. Turns out that the incidental music was written 20 years later than the overture, and that the overture was not intended to be a precursor of the play, it was a standalone piece of music. And guess what? It was a unique piece of music in the annals of music history. It was one of, if not the first, tone poem. Do you know what a tone poem is? Hello, everybody. You can say no or you can say yes. You can't just, you can't just go. No. Okay, everybody knows what a tone poem is, you think they do, raise your hand. That's two. That's a, come on, try a little bit harder. One more time. You know what a tone poem is, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You're a conductor, you don't count, don't you? But out of this big 400 person crowd, we've got about nine, ten, twelve people that know what it is. I'm going to assume the rest of you don't know, right? A tone poem is the... Well, let me put it this way. When Mozart and Beethoven and Haydn wrote a symphony or wrote an overture, it was on pure, purely musical grounds. They have a theme, they have a second theme, they may have a third theme, and then they go back and repeat those and then they go on to the next section, which is called the development section, where they take one of those three themes and they start jazzing it up, adding scales and variations and so on and so forth. And after you go through different keys, after they do that, they recapitulate back to the very first theme of the first um, section. And then they do the next theme, and then they add something at the end called a coda. And the coda is the grand finale. Bum, ba, da, da, ba, da, bum, 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 bum. You know, it goes on for who knows how long, and then it goes bum, ba, da, da, bum, bum, and it's over, right? Okay, that's called sonata allegro form, and it's not intended to describe anything. It's intended to be like a big building. It's architecture. It's not telling a story. Okay, it's not the story about it. A tone poem actually is a poem or a story told with musical tones. 
So it's very graphically a story. And when we get to Midsummer Night's Dream, he is talking about the fairies, and he's talking about the different characters of the, of the play. And one of the uh, males who um, this uh, woman has fallen in love with, perhaps inappropriately, has the head of a donkey. Okay? He has the head of a donkey. And so, when they're talking about him, the violins start an octave higher and they go, damn, 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 damn. And that's, so he's painting, again, uh, a tone poem, a, a picture. He's painting in music the story. He did this at 17 years of age. And he beat Richard Strauss, the famous German tone poem, and Franz Liszt by, oh, I don't know, 50 plus years. I mean, how great is that, really? So, okay, when you hear, eh, 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 and the violins, you'll know that it's okay to laugh. <laughs> it's okay to laugh, and all the stern people next to you will go, what are you laughing at? What are you laughing at? I'm laughing at the donkey head, don't you know? Okay, I'm having the whole thing. I just made that all up. No, no I didn't. No, I didn't. No, that's that's all. That's all very real. All right, we're doing something else in Shakespearean, but it's two pieces. They're they're not directly because they're not called anything similar. One's called West Side Story, and one's called The Lion King. And The Lion King is about Hamlet. And West Side Story, of course, is Romeo and Juliet. So we're going to do a, a really nice 10-minute setting of different pieces from uh, Bernstein and Sondheim's West Side Story. Uh, and then we're going to do uh, uh, John's uh, Lion King. We're going to do The Circle of Life. And that's very interesting. Uh, we have a wonderful, anybody heard the Calville chorus before? Do you think it's really good? Well, I'm very critical. And I don't want to burst anybody's balloon in here. So I will agree with you. I think it's really good. Okay, and these are people, um, Many of them are, are high flute professionals, many of them are amateurs. Uh, but they, they sing and they study and they articulate better than the articulation of this group. It always blows my mind because it's so difficult for singers to sing with a big voice and to articulate words that you can actually hear. I'm surprised that shows like The Voice or America's Got Talent or um, what was the other one, um, American Idol, how badly articulation would be with some of these young artists. They just, they just, it was like somebody had amputated their tongue or something. There was no articulation. You couldn't hear the words right. And then some other man or woman would come up and crisply you heard everything they said. Wow, that would always get my attention. Um, this choir articulates phenomenally. So in this Lion King excerpt, um, uh, The Circle of Life, it's not written for one choir. It's written for two choirs. And both choirs operate independently but work in harmony together simultaneously. So we've got one choir that's going bum 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 setting this rhythm. They're singing in harmony. They're going along. And the other one's doing long sustained notes or singing the melody and then they switch it up. Very, very clever. That's called a double chorus. And Bach used it and 
many great choral writers have used it, and Elton John used it in The Lion King. It's very cool. Um, I'm sure you're going to enjoy that. Does anybody have any questions? Robert? Stand up, Robert. I think you should stand up. Okay, I'm going to sing. The, no, he's not going to talk. I'm going to talk for him. Okay, he can talk. <clears throat> Sounds good so far. A little bit closer. Sounds good so far. Okay. This gentleman is uh, part of my, my inspiration for this show. Because he, I knew Mendelssohn and stuff, but he said, why don't you try Marconi's Hamlet with, from the movie Hamlet, and it's got this great uh, solo flute thing and choir and and uh, I can get you that. Um, how many records have you done? 14,000 or what is it? 1,400. 1,400. Oh, 1,400. I knew it was That's 1,400 different records you've produced? Yes. And each one of them has several pieces of music on it. Full albums. Full album. 1,400 albums. So he knows his music and he's been a, a delightful uh, collaborator with myself and helping us get either soloist and were any of you here when we did Thor, Conan? Uh, he and Robert arranged for those that music and for um, the composer of uh, Thor to be here that day. So thank you. I just wanted to personally thank you for all your work, Robert Townsend. interesting about this show. And when I talk about the caliber of the musicians in the California Philharmonic, I'm, I'm not trying to exaggerate this. Um, we have two first flutes. Uh, one has been the first flute of the pageant of the masters and can't always get off and, and she's uh, been a professor here, there, and everywhere else. She's a solo flute in this place, that place. Um, and she has been our principal flutist since the orchestra was founded. All right, her backup flutist, Paul Freed, spent 14 years as the associate principal of the Boston Symphony. Um, he was 14 years principal of Boston Pops Orchestra. He was with the Pittsburgh Orchestra before that for uh, a number of years. And this guy is second chair in the orchestra, right? He's not the first guy. He's behind the lady that uh, you'll hear today. Well, then we moved down to our, our um, third flute, and she was a soloist with Ron Paul. Uh, and uh, what's his name? My mind's got dead. Uh, Galloway at the Hollywood Bowl. They were doing a big flute spectacular thing with these two world great flutists. And then they played one piece that was a trio. And who of all the people they could have picked um, to join them on stage at the Hollywood Bowl but was Valerie King. And she has about six albums out. And she's our third flute and piccolo player. Our second flutist, Sarah Anden, I met her when she had just graduated from some She has toured, or appeared, I should say, in the Canary Islands, Krakow. She just got back from Italy on Monday, where she was doing recitals. And one of the things she's done is she's hooked up with Robert Townsend, and it has the solo repertoire um, that features her doing some of the great film scores. So you're going to have a chance to hear that. And oh, today we're going to have the American premiere of Hamlet. Never been played in America, this, this music. The, the American premiere of Hamlet by Mark Money. Is that it for premieres today? Oh, and this arrangement, this setting of Shakespeare and Love has never been performed live in, um, in where? Where? Okay. Oh, never been 
none in North America. So you're hearing a couple of premieres today along with it. Well, I think I've got to stop. Is that correct? I'm all done. So enjoy.